Ladies and gentlemen, the Empower channel brings you Professor Miguel Benitez. Are you ready? Montgomery Brazilian Jiu Jitsu from Montgomery, New Jersey. This is an interesting story because Miguel, professor, he's like the new generation. He started his martial art training at age 21, a meteoric rise to success. How did he do it? Well, he says, I wanna put the students first. I wanna look at it from what's in their best interest it kind of sounds like the time-tested theory of the chairman that always said, we got to put students number one. Well, Miguel is following that. Representing the Empower channel today is interviewer, one of the best, Jose Escobar. Jose, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, John. And uh, welcome, Miguel. Thanks for taking the time to be with us this morning. Uh, I know it's a valuable time. I'm sure you're doing a bunch of things normally in this time bracket. So we appreciate that. Um, first of all, I want to kind of let everyone know, I'm not sure how many people know who Miguel Benitez is, but your community certainly knows who you are because you've done some tremendous things in a short amount of time. So just to kind of enlighten the viewers and the listeners today, your school, Montgomery Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you have taken that school and doubled it in less than two years. What is your secret to doing that? How did you do that? Uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for having me. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's a crazy time right now for everyone. But when the opportunity came up that I could, you know, uh, you guys wanted to bring me on, I was, I think, I think this is very important uh, for all, all of us to kind of get together and share how we're trying to get through these times. Now, Jose, to answer your question, um, I don't think it's really anything. Uh, it's a big secret. I think what happens is my secret has always been putting the students first, as John had mentioned. But more importantly, before I even opened my doors, one of my biggest tasks and biggest goals was how can I implement myself into the community? I didn't want to be another business in Montgomery. I didn't want to be another martial arts school in Montgomery. I wanted to be Montgomery's martial arts school. So the only way to do that was to truly invest myself in not just the students that wanted to train jujitsu, but everyone. So before our doors even opened, you know, I was, I was joining the MBA, the Montgomery Business Association, which helps out local small businesses. And we all stay invested in each other and communicate and help each other grow as best as we can. I started reaching out to other local businesses. I immediately got involved with the Boy Scouts. I did a demo for them, uh, the Girl Scouts or the Daisy Scouts, I should say. And I think the most important thing I did was I got uh, intertwined with the youth wrestling program. I met with the, one of the wrestling coaches. I went over there and then we started to develop a system where we could have kids on the mat year round. And it's just being visible. It's being at all these locations. And I've gone to places not representing Montgomery Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, just representing myself. One of my students was on a Pop Warner team. He had a game and I went there in the rain to support not as Montgomery Beach JJ, but as myself. And people know who you are. They recognize you and they recognize what you're doing. But it's, it's students first, becoming a part of the community, and then everything else will start falling into place. So, wow, strong. Regarding COVID-19, it's no secret. Everyone is struggling right now. What did you do specifically? What was your first plan of attack, your strategy? As soon as you saw, okay, my school is shutting down, what do I do next? Kind of elaborate on that. So, Jose, I'm a big believer that, you, you know, our black belt can't just start and end on the mats. You know, we, we, I teach lessons on these mats. I say it at my school all the time. I don't teach jujitsu for jujitsu. I teach jujitsu for life. I want you to take these lessons, and when times get hard, Take the lessons that you learned here and use them in your everyday life. And I, I preach that every day. So COVID-19, I truly think, was a blessing in disguise for so many instructors because now the spotlight's on us. Now it's our opportunity to put into practice what we've been saying all these years. I tell my students, if you're in bottom side control, you're in bottom out, don't panic. Breathe. Take a, and take a second to figure out your plan of attack 
and then we execute. We have to continue moving, otherwise we're just staying there and, and losing. We're dying if we stay stagnant. So when COVID-19 happened and my school got shut down, I announced that Saturday that we were going to be shutting down for a week. The original plan was March 23rd, and I was freaked out we were gonna be closed for a week. I wish it was just a week looking back. But that Monday, we immediately went to the Facebook Live classes. Uh, you know, I am a black belt under Tom DeBlass. He did a great job with the affiliation, creating an affiliation page. And we had uh, affiliate students or affiliate instructors going live on their class. So we would time everything where, you know, take a class with me on our student page, then go over and check out the affiliation page. And we would take turns teaching a live class or teaching seminars. We, we became involved. Um, it got a little harder because after two weeks, I think someone had driven by and seen me teaching uh, a demonstration with one of my students. They called the police, police came in, said we were still open and training, so they completely shut us down. I was only allowed to be in here uh, by myself. So it would have been very easy for me to be like, well, that's it, there's, there's nothing else I can do. But that's not what I've taught my students. I haven't taught my students to just say, that's it. No, we find a way to progress and fight. So I never took more than 24 hours to transition and pivot. So as soon as we got shut down that way, investment in cameras, investment in microphones, investment in a dummy, starting a Zoom class, setting up a Zoom schedule, and staying active and showing my students that, hey, if you're willing to give me your time, I'm going to give you everything I have. And I make it a point to do those classes from inside my school so that psychologically, even though they're at home, they're still here. But that's what I did when, when COVID-19 hit. It's we just take a breath, find a plan of attack, and execute. There is no end. There is no end because staying stagnant is death. You know, Miguel, it sounds to me like you're an expert in that field of technology and being a, you know, having all this virtual system, you know, and processes set up and all that. Are you an expert? Absolutely not. Uh, what I am is I'm, I'm very lucky. I have some great friends that I've been able to reach out to. And uh, listen, I don't know the difference between a digital camera and a webcam. Like I, I'm just... I reached out to the, we have, a, we have a tremendous affiliation. I can't stress it enough. Uh, the Tom DeBlass affiliation is an incredible network and we're constantly in communication with each other. Um, I've reached out to uh, uh, Pete McHugh, uh, who's someone that I, I truly look up to in that realm uh, because his videos right. are incredible. I, I asked him the same thing. I'm like, dude, I'm like, when did you become like a camera? He goes, I'm not. He goes, it's all pretty easy. You just have to figure it out. So I'm in no way an expert. I'm just someone that is dedicated to their students and knows that every day I'm not providing something is another day that they're closer to just kind of walking away. Excellent. Yeah, I, I assumed that you weren't an expert. I was being sarcastic, but, you know, because uh, we've had conversations and that sort of a thing. And a lot of people are out there like, what do I do? How do I do it? You know, I don't know anything about technology or cameras or lighting and all these various things. But the point is that you figured it out, right? And that separates you apart from the masses because the ones who succeed in tough times like this and the ones who come out on the other end stronger are the ones who figure it out, right? They're proactive, not reactive. And, uh, and you're clearly one of those type of people. So speaking of that, um, reinvesting in your business. I know you've had a lot of time to kind of do some things in your school. And uh, you kind of mentioned to me that you were doing some remodeling and, and just kind of figuring out how you can use this time wisely to propel your school to the next level once you open those doors. Can you elaborate on that and kind of tell us a little bit about what you've been up to with the school? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things I think we can talk about is the, is the physical change that I've done to the academy, which is, you know, it, it's a little bit uh, crazy to even think that because I just had a grand opening for a brand new facility. So how are you renovating a brand new facility? Well, you know, attention is in the details. So we redid the waiting area, you know, it's got a Wayne's coat now, it's painted. I did it all by myself and it was a great excuse for me to buy tools that I've always wanted. Uh, my wife's telling me that I need to come up with a hobby because now I have all these extra tools. So we did the Wayne's coating. Uh, the heavy bags are brand new. Those were just installed yesterday. Uh, we framed up the second mat. The workout area is getting expanded. We are doing a chalkboard wall. Um, we're doing a retail rack, so there will be an actual retail area when people come in. So when my students walk in the first day, the physical appearance is going to right away come out and they'll notice that there's been work being put in. Now, going beyond that, I think that if we paid attention to some of the things that are going on, we're noticing that, you know, these virtual classes are the, are the wave of the future. Uh, 
EFC also notices that because you guys, the last time we spoke, Jose, I, I told you this story. I was in the shower and I was, that's where I do my best thinking in the shower. And I'm like, how can I really keep my students involved? How can I keep the Zoom going? And I was like, man, I wish I knew how to code and I could make an app. And lo and behold, Jose calls me the next day and starts talking about Budo code. And I think that's the next pivot because now with an app like that, and you're offering your students weekly challenges, you're keeping your students involved and in, in a situation where they're comfortable because it's only with other students at the academy. You're giving them access to a video library of techniques. Now, jujitsu is not something they do for an hour three times a day. Montgomery Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or your academy, whoever you might be, is now a part of their everyday routine. They have a one hour lunch break. They can watch 30 minutes of video. It's part of their everyday life. It also eliminates distance being an issue with bringing in new students. If you're five minutes away from a school that's five minutes closer to someone, they might go to the school that maybe it's not as big or not as good or as reputable because it's closer, because we have busy lives. Nobody wants to add 10, 15 minutes to their day. But now if you only have to come to my school twice a week and I'm offering you Zoom classes and I'm offering you a video library, now my school will entice you a little bit more and you will be more likely to make that commute to drive here and attend this academy because I'm providing more than just the physical act activity and the physical academy. You have access to the academy 24 hours a day at the palm of your hands. And I think that's where we need to go. You know, 20 years ago when Mercedes installed Push to Start, it was luxurious, but eventually luxury will become standard. My job is to get ahead of that curve before everyone else is doing it. Powerful, powerful. So for the school out there who's saying, and I've heard a couple of schools tell me directly, say, you know what, Jose, I'm considering you know, closing my doors. I don't know if this is gonna be something that we're gonna come back from. I don't know if things are gonna improve. The, the media is telling me all these negative things and this is gonna last a year and what have you. Uh, and let's just say, for example, the doors reopen and everything kind of slowly gets back to phase one, two, and three, and we get back to normalcy. What happens if a phase two comes of this, you know, coronavirus or some other hybrid version of it, you know? How are you positioned right now in a, in a, in a better way to be better prepared and equipped? Like you were just talking about Budo code and you're talking about your Zoom classes. You kind of learned that, picked it up along the way. Are there any other things that you kind of have prepared just in case something else happens? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think whenever something happens, you need to pay attention uh, and be aware that it can happen again. Uh, it's a lesson that I've learned on the mats. If I get caught in an arm bar, I don't say, well, I'm never going to get caught in an arm bar. That's a fluke. No, I'm going to work on my arm bar defense. I'm going to watch the tape and see where I went wrong, what I could have done better. How did I escape? How did I almost get tapped? Same thing with this. Uh, you know, the familiarity with the Zoom is a lot, uh, is a lot better on my end. Uh, the promotion of the Zoom classes is something that I have had to adapt to and become a lot more, uh, I think Pete McHugh talked about this when he was here, the four points of, uh, you know, introducing the class where it's got to be social media, it's got to be this, it's got to be that. And that's important. And I think those are things that we're more prepared for when it comes around because it's not the first time. And we need to understand that this could happen again, whether it's in six months or 60 years from now. But if we're paying attention, we can put a plan in place. You know, some of the best teams, you look at a team like, you know, uh, Alabama's football team or the New England Patriots, when they win a game, they don't focus on the things that went right. They focus on the things that went wrong so that they can prevent that in the future. Now, I'm doing a lot of things right right now, but I'm aware of the things that I'm doing wrong because that's going to be the separation between failure or success in the future. And if someone is feeling right now like they don't want to open the doors back up, they want to close, they're scared, they're nervous, that's a natural feeling. You ask any black belt on the road to black belt, they wanted to quit. They want to. We've all been there. There comes a point where you're like, I can't do this anymore. But you have to break through that. You have to get past that. And that has nothing to do with Zoom or, or teaching classes or knowing technology. That has to do with this. And with this, and that's why only 3% of people that train jujitsu get their black belt. And unfortunately, maybe only 3% of people will come out of this with a successful academy. But you've got to decide if you want to be on the 97% end of the table or that 3% end of the table. And I think if you have students 
who care about you and you've impacted their lives, you owe it to them to do everything you have till the very end to be part of that 3%. Excellent. Excellent. Two last questions, uh, Miguel. So the first one is you mentioned a feeder program into the wrestling team, the local wrestling team for you. You know, that, that's that obviously it's working really well for you, but how does somebody not knowing how to go about doing that? You know, how important is it, would you say, and how do you go about feeding into a wrestling team or, or the local Boy Scouts, like you said? How do you go about doing that? So I think number one is just like anything else, uh, you have to start doing some research, figure out who you can talk to, who you can get a hold of. And once you open up a school, you get so many students that come into your academy and you know, outside of these doors, they have jobs and careers and friends and they start introducing you to people. But you have, a, you have to have a plan of attack. Uh, I've seen through my training, the benefits that I've had by incorporating wrestling into my training and the people that I've met through wrestling that have transitioned to jujitsu and the success that they find. So I knew right away that I, that's something I wanted to get involved in, number one. Number two is just a matter of reaching out. I mean, you can find your local youth wrestling program. If you have a son that wants to wrestle or a daughter that wants to wrestle, you go online, you Google your township's wrestling program, there it is. Um, it's amazing the information you can get on the internet now. It's just, you know, you have to have the, uh, the motivation to want to do it. So right away, it's just like anything else. You go to the first practice, you meet the coach, you meet the guy who runs the program, you start shaking hands and kissing babies and make sure that you're the type of person that people want to train with. You're the type of person that people want their kids to emulate, and that's important. Uh, and I'm not gonna lie, I'd be lying if I said to you that I showed up by myself. I absolutely did not. If I want you to trust me with your kids, the best way for me to demonstrate that is to bring my own child with me and show you that I have a child. So I know the importance of you giving somebody else your child. And it's not a ploy. It's me showing that, hey, I'm not just the jujitsu guy. Right. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a man. I'm you. I'm you. So now follow me. Great point. Excellent. Now, last question here. On your spare, non-productive time. So we all know everything you have right now, Miguel, lies within your comfort zone. That's the reality, mm -hmm. right? In the circle of your comfort zone. Everything that you are striving towards and everything you want lies outside of your comfort zone. So that's gonna stretch you, it's gonna push you, it's gonna make you uncomfortable, but you know that you have to live in that area, in that space, in order to get what you want in that next level. So what is Miguel doing on his spare non-productive time to keep that ax sharp? Well, number one, I definitely stalk your Instagram page, Jose, and I definitely uh, take a look <laughs> at all the books that you're reading, and uh, I try to incorporate some of them into my daily routine. That's, that's absolutely something I do. But I think that speaks into what I do in my spare and unproductive time. What I do is I, I find people who are doing what I want to do, who are accomplishing what I, I want to accomplish, and who are people that I truly respect, and you being one of them as well, and John, and I see what they're doing and I, I try to follow what they're doing or I try to incorporate some of those things into my daily routine. And some of them are not things that I want to do. You know, when, when Tom talks about taking 10,000 steps, I did 12,000 steps yesterday. I was not happy about it. I, I, I like, I was hurting. I was like, why am I doing this? But it's what we need to do. Uh, you know, we have another, uh, one of Tom's black belts talks about yoga. He does yoga. And I haven't done yoga in 15 years. I've been incorporating that into my daily routine. And well, now how can I incorporate this into the academy? Every day you have to find a way to step outside of your comfort zone. That's the only way you're going to progress. You know, I, I was very comfortable just working my nine to five job. I decided to step out of my comfort zone and open up an academy. We grew very quickly. I was very comfortable in my academy. But, you know, just like a goldfish, it can only grow as big as its tank. I knew we were limited in that space. And while it would have been uh, you know, more monetarily beneficial for me to stay in that space, the goal was never to be rich. The goal was to spread jujitsu and martial arts and impact lives. And I tell this to my students, I built the first school. You built the second school. And as long as they keep showing up, and this is where I'm really stepping out of my comfort zone, I've already started thinking about knocking down the wall and taking the space next door. 
because you have to be ready for the next step if you don't plan for it and it shows right. up you're never going to be able to seize that opportunity so the pro i think what i do in my spare time i don't have spare time because this thing just doesn't shut off it's constantly going and then when i do get a break i get a little message from tom and that that just you know, <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, Miguel, for being here. Thank you for all your wisdom and for sharing with the martial arts community and all the school owners that are listening. Back to you, John. Miguel Benitez, thank you so much. Uh, I love the message about stepping out of, out of Miguel's comfort zone, having that terrific breakthrough, even though you're tempted to think, should I quit? you brought out that there's a separation between failure and success and that you have to pay attention and put a plan in place. And now that luxury will become a standard. I got some really great pearls from your messages and you shared your energy and your spirit. We love that so much. Thank you so much for dedicating yourself today and forever and yesteryear to the high standards of the martial arts. Miguel Benitez, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, guys. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Peace. Take care. Thanks. OK, thank you so much, Miguel. Enjoy. All right, guys. Have a good one. Thank you. Take care. Appreciate it.